Bueno, buenos días a, a todos en este nuevo seminario, primer seminario de regulación Francia con Zoom de este año. Hoy tenemos el placer de contar con Xavier Fernández Real. Él es eh, matemático e ingeniería física, creo que es el nombre de la carrera de la UPC. También el máster en Cambridge, en Reino Unido. Realizó la tesis en Zúrich bajo la dirección de Figali y después de alguna estancia en Texas Austin, tengo por aquí apuntado, eh, bueno, pues tiene un postdoc en el lugar de donde nos está hablando, la Ecole Polytechnique de Lausana en Suiza. Y además de eso, eh, es premio Vicenca de 2021 y la razón primera por, para contar con él la primera para nosotros como Universidad de Zaragoza y como sponsor de, del, del Rubio de Francia, del premio Rubio de Francia, es que es el último recipiente, reci, recipiente creo que está bien correcto, del premio Rubio de Francia de la Real Sociedad Matemática Española 2022. Así que, por todos esos motivos, eh, muchísimas gracias, Javier, por estar aquí y... Eh, bueno, eh, cuando quieras, ¿no? no he dicho en lo que es experto, el... el eh, eh, estudia problemas de frontera libre que ap aparecen en problemas de transiciones de fase, ecuaciones diferenciales eh, eh, derivadas parciales y en particular del problema del obstáculo es creo que algo de lo que nos va a contar hoy. El título de la charla lo tenéis delante. Cuando quieras Alejandro, muchas gracias. Ahí digo, Xavier. Ah, perdón. Ah, no, muchas gracias a vosotros por la invitación. Es un placer poder estar aquí. Me hubiera gustado estar en Zaragoza, pero bueno, igualmente es un placer poder dar esta, esta charla. So, I'm going to give the talk in English. Um, so, you see the title of the talk here. It's Regularity Theory for Elliptic PD. Given that it's a colloquium talk, I thought it reasonable to give more or less an overview of my area of research. And while explaining a bit what I study, uh, I can also introduce some of the results we got, but I think it's also interesting to talk about the area in general. And regularity theory for elliptic PD is a very generic topic. It's a very wide topic that, that contains part of what I do. And it also happens to be the title of one of my books. So it's also an occasion to advertise. And um, let me say that uh, I'm, I'm gonna talk about this, but I'm open to being interrupted at any point feel free to stop me, to ask me questions. I realize that sometimes I speak a bit fast, so feel free to just stop me, make me repeat, or ask anything you have in mind. But let's start. Very broadly, I'm going to introduce elliptic PDE or certain classes of elliptic PDE. From, I've chosen to do that from a probabilistic point of view because I, ha I have the feeling that it's some shared intuition we have among mathematicians. This probability intuition is kind of recurrent, and it makes it easier to explain certain concepts that maybe can be too technical from a certain point of view, but probabilistically, they are very easy to explain. So let me start. I'm going to, to start with uh, this probabilistic interpretation in, in a way that is very much inspired by a talk that precisely Luis Silvestre gave this last year in the Abel Prize ceremony in honor of Luis Caffarelli, which is the current world expert in elliptic PD. So I think it's very fitting that I can start like that. So we start with a uh, discrete random walk in this picture. So I have a picture here. Here you have a depiction of a sketch of Paragota, let's say, which is a bit like New York, but still like with these city blocks here. And let's assume that I'm a tourist, this red dot that has just arrived to Paragota, okay? And my goal when I arrive to Zaragoza now is that I want to reach the river, the Ebro. And to do that, I follow a, a very much non-optimal strategy, which is at each point in this grid, I choose a random direction around me and I go to that direction. And I do that each time until I reach the boundary of the city. And my question is, what's the probability that I'm gonna reach the Ebro river before reaching one like the outside of the city, one of the other three sides, okay? So let's compute it. It's relatively straightforward to compute. If I call u, 
the probability to reach the river before reaching the outside of the city from a point x1, x2, we have that the value of u at each point is always equal to the average value of u around the point, which is exactly this formula here, right? Since once I'm at one point, I have the same probability to choose any of the directions around me, the value of u at one point, which is the probability of reaching the river from that point, is always the average probability of reaching the river from the four points around me, which is this, no? I have this city blocks with site H. I have this formula and I can, now I can repeat the process at, at each point. So I start from here, I repeat, I choose direction at random, I repeat, I repeat until I reach the boundary. And when I reach the boundary, on the boundary, I already know the value of u, right? If the value of u on this side is gonna be zero because I'm already outside the city and on the river is gonna be one because I'm already on the river. So the probability of reaching the river is exactly one. Now, with these two conditions, I can put the system, I can solve what, what's the value of u. In doing that, I can play with the equation from before. So I just move around things. I move the four, I distribute the u, I get an equation like that. And now I can divide by h squared. I have two different terms that I can identify as two incremental quotients of second order, which is like two discrete partial derivatives in the directions x1 and x2. And I get this equation here which is that zero is the sum of discrete partial derivatives. And now I can let h go to zero. And when I let h go to zero, I can take the limit and I obtain. So I just make smaller. I repeat the process with smaller and smaller grid. And in the limit, I obtain a continuous process. And I obtain a continuous equation, which is called the Laplace equation, which is basically an operator, a linear operator, like the one before, applied to the function u. That is just the sum of pure second derivatives in the coordinate directions. And I have this random walk here that moves until the boundary. This is also like a continuous path, okay? So what we have done here is we have obtained the Laplacian, which is this linear operator applied to you as the infinitesimal generator of a random walk or a Brownian motion, which is a certain type of stochastic process, which is something that we can more or less be familiar with. Formally, or more technically, uh, we actually have that if x t is a Brownian motion, or like a stochastic process given by the Brownian motion, starting from a point x, then given any utility function v0, if we denote by v the expected value of the evolution of v0 under the Brownian motion, then v satisfies this equation in Fourier variables. This is in Fourier because you can prove that using a characteristic function, which in real variables is this equation here, which is the heat equation, okay? This is actually the definition of being the infinitesimal generator of a Brownian motion, which is the same thing we've done before, a ballistic point of view, okay? So we have obtained the Laplacian. The Laplacian is the elliptic operator or the second order elliptic operator, the most canonical one, the most famous one, the most common one. It's an operator that we have all seen during other, our undergrads. And it's this, we have obtained in, in various dimensions, it's just the sum of pure second derivatives in the coordinate directions. You can also define it as the divergence of the gradient. It's like this very tautologically, but in this case, you can define the Laplacian just by defining divergence and gradient. So you can even do that in manifolds, right? So that's what I want to talk about now. The Laplacian, which is what I care about as an analyst. What I'm gonna do is I'm, I'm listing here three properties of the Laplacian that are gonna be recurrent during this talk. The first property I care about and probably the most important property for me for the Laplacian is that it satisfies the maximum principle. That is, if a function satisfies that its Laplacian is zero in a ball or in any domain, then necessarily the maximum and by linearity, the minimum of the function is always achieved on the boundary of the domain. And this works in any subdomain. You see, this is a quite a strong property if you try to drop functions that satisfy that is not so easy, right? It's, it gives structure. Second property, there is always a unique solution to this boundary value problem. Let's say it's Laplacian of u is equal to f in b1 and u is equal to g on the boundary of b1 or any other domain. Then there always exists a solution u under reasonable assumptions, which is also a property of the Laplacian in this case. And third property, and that's the property I care more about, and that's the first instance of regularity 
for elliptic PD is that any solution to the previous system, U always gains two derivatives from F. That is, if U satisfies this, then U is always two derivatives smoother than F. And that's the property I care about. And that's what more or less I'm gonna be talking about in this, in this talk, about properties similar to this one in other settings. What other settings, for example? So let me slightly generalize the, the previous picture. Suppose that now I'm back to Paragotha and now at each point, I can choose a direction at random, but now not all directions are equally likely, okay? So there's maybe a certain direction that is twice as likely than the other one. In this case, maybe horizontal directions are twice as likely as vertical ones for me to choose. That could be because the streets are nicer or, or there's, there's sun that affects only the vertical streets, but the buildings block it in the horizontal streets. So I would rather go horizontally. And I wonder what happens if I repeat the process from before now? Well, I can just write the equation same as before. Now the value of u at each point is not gonna be the average, the exact average, but it's gonna be a weighted average where I give twice as much value to the horizontal directions than the vertical ones. But I can repeat and I can now let h go to zero exactly as before and obtain a limiting equation, which is very similar to before. And instead of being just a sum of second derivatives of pure second derivatives, now I have to put a weight two in front of one of the directions because it's like the direction that is twice more likely. This is now not the Laplace operator, but this we call now analytic equation with constant coefficients. And the thing is that this cannot be, the properties of this equation cannot be that different from before. No? So I can further repeat the previous process, make it even more general and assume that at each different point, my set of preferences changes. So at each corner, at each street intersection, there's a different set of preferences that tells me which directions are more likely and less likely. In doing that, we obtain, like before, it's an equation, it's an elliptic equation with coefficients, but now the coefficients are non-constant. And we obtain that it's an equation in which basically at each point, we have a different elliptic equation. And this is the limiting procedure that we have obtained from before. In this case, this is called a general elliptic equation of second order, in this case in non-divergence form, which is not important, with x dependence, which basically means we have a different elliptic equation at each point of the plane. Now, again, this cannot be that different or that it should not have qualitative properties very different from before. The process we are following is more or less comparable, so to say. And this is exactly what, what I'm gonna say now is that under the assumption, that my set of preferences doesn't degenerate in, it, any, in any direction at any point. That is, at all points, I have that all directions are possible, maybe not equally possible, but they are all possible, that there's no directions that has probability zero. In that case, it would be degenerate, and I would have an equation in one less dimension. If all directions have some probability, some non-zero probability, then the same properties from before still hold. So the same properties I mentioned for the Laplacian are still true. That is an operator of this form, which is not so important, the particular form is just an equation, a different elliptic equation at each point still satisfies a maximum principle. If I put this boundary value problem where the equation, the operator is equal to F inside B1 and is equal to G on the boundary, the U is equal to G on the boundary, this boundary value problem still has a unique solution. And solutions to this equation, which is the most interesting property for me, are still gaining derivatives. In this case, the solution U gains two derivatives with respect to F, but also with respect to A. You see now A is like a coefficient here, so the regularity of this of the preferences also plays a role. But if F and A have the same regularity, U gains two more derivatives. So the, the equation is regularizing from the data, F and A, the solution gains two derivatives. Again, this is the type of property that I care about. And this is a very short, very fast summary of the local theory for elliptic PD. And now I want to still generalize it a bit more. And to do that, before going to a slight more generalization, let me start with this rather grandiose slide where you see 
two pictures. Basically, and here I say that a triumph in modern mathematics lies in the fact that we can understand random patterns that are not solely Gaussian. And to do that, I'm, I'm plotting here the evolution of a stock. The stock market is something that is something that we have more or less been exposed to, even if it's only on the news. And it's one of these examples of apparently Brownian motions that more or less kind of society can understand, right? And here is the, the stock, here is the, the distribution of the, the increments of the stock. And what, what happens is that the stock, the stock market or people have been working for many years. It's not true for the last 20 years, but before that it was true under the impression that the stock market was actually behaving like a Brownian motion. And this is despite the fact that already Mandelbrot, the, the same guy of the fractal set, observed in the 60s that this is not true. Like the stock market doesn't really behave like a Brownian motion. Actually, the increments in the stock market are far too wide and far too often to be part of a distribution that decays exponentially, like the Gaussian distribution that you would get from a Brownian motion. And that's because in reality, the distribution of the increments, it follows like a, a stable distribution. It's called an alpha stable distribution, which is a distribution with thick tails. That it's a distribution that doesn't have finite variance. Here you have a picture of what the empirical distribution is and what the, the alpha stable distribution is and what a, a Gaussian distribution is. And that's because these increments that satisfy an alpha stable distribution follow a stochastic process, um, which is called a Levy process, which is what I want to introduce that. Now, it's a, basically a generalization of a Brownian motion that I'm gonna mention again. So let's go back to the previous example. Suppose that again, I'm a tourist, I'm in Zaragoza, and here I say, I'm no longer restricted by the laws of physics. Uh, and I can choose any point at random in the world. If you want, alternatively, if you feel more comfortable satisfying the laws of physics, you can say that you can choose a random direction around you and then choose also a random velocity. Before I just I was just choosing a random direction and moving. Now I choose a random direction and a random velocity and I move that velocity in that direction. So maybe in one second, I'm moving two positions instead of one. So I start from one point and now I know that I, at each point I can move anywhere. And now instead of having the Ebro River, the Ebro River, if I understand it mathematically, it would be a line, which is a set of major zero, which doesn't matter very much. I assume that I have the Ebro C, or if you want, you can change cities and go to a city that has C, but I have the Ebro C. And I asked the same question as before. What's the probability that the first time I jump outside of the city, I do so inside the C and not outside of the city? Okay, same question as before. Now it's much more general because I'm taking like the situation from before, but I'm saying that I can jump anywhere. The thing is that now I have to tell you how I can jump to places, right? So I'm gonna have some, I can compute the probability of, as before of jumping into the sea instead of jumping outside. And this probability will depend on a kernel that I call here K of H that tells me what's the chance that I jump to a certain point, right? It's a kernel defined in the whole space, and it tells me this. This is exactly the same equation as before. Just before, this kernel was only supported in the four directions around me, so this was just one fourth in the four directions. Now it's a kernel that takes into account the probability that you jump in any other direction in the whole space. So it's a kernel that sums one. It's like a generalization from the previous setting. And I can repeat the process from before. I can let now h go to zero, I can obtain an equation, so I can play with the equation, obtain this equation, I let h go to zero. I assume that this kernel, k of h, it's converging to something. I'm being very hand wavy here, I'm aware. And I obtain in the limit another linear equation applied to you. But now it's this type of equation that depends on the kernel. It's the integral of increments of u weighted by a kernel that is given to me by someone, okay? And the process from before, in the limit, we're gonna see that it's it's actually not a continuous process anymore. It kind of jumps around. It's not, we are not forced to always move in the position next to us. We can actually do small jumps now or arbitrarily big jumps, in fact. So this operator L here, 
differently from before, if I want to compute it at one point, if the kernel K has an arbitrary large support, I need to know the value of U everywhere, right? So to compute L of U at one point, I need to know the value of U everywhere. So changing the value of U very far away from me, it's gonna change the value of the operator applied at one point. This is called a non-local operator. Now I'm gonna show more examples. And this is precisely the type of, of operator that appears as infinitesimal generators of this process, this levy process, which is this new generalized random walk. Okay, so let me be a bit more precise. Hopefully not much more. So formally what I said is that we are studying these things called levy processes. So I apologize to probabilities because I'm probably butchering probability here, but I'm trying to convey an intuition. Uh, levy processes are basically um, a Brownian motion or a type of Brownian motion. A Brownian motion is a, is a process with stationary independent increments and continuous paths. You take a Brownian motion, you remove the assumption of having continuous paths, you obtain a levy process. Basically, it's a Brownian motion that is not forced to satisfy a continuous path. Here, we have one picture here. And once we have this, we have this stochastic process, I can repeat the procedure I followed before, and I can obtain an equation satisfied by the evolution of a, of a utility function under the process. And I'm gonna get an equation, it's a parabolic equation of this type, that is better expressed in Fourier. So it's for some operator L of V, such that in Fourier is given by the multiplication of what's called a Fourier multiplier, A of C times the Fourier transform of V. In the previous case that we had the Laplacian, this A of C was just C squared. And C squared in Fourier happens to be the, the Fourier multiplier of the Laplacian. That's why we recovered the Laplacian. Now I'm saying that this type of processes gives a more general Fourier symbol that I call A of C, that is not necessarily C squared, but that gives other types of operators. Okay, if I go back to the X variables, so the real variables, the operator L, sorry, the operator L that appears is called an integral differential operator and happens to be precisely an operator of the previous form, this what I called non-local operators. An L of U has this form. It's just the integral of increments of U against a kernel K that is given to me. And in the case of Levy process, this kernel K is called the Levy measure, which is gonna be a measure and satisfies these three properties here, which are not very important. It just to say that there's some properties that you satisfy. And then you can actually recover the Fourier multiplier A from the Levy measure K in a very explicit way. So you can relate one to another. I'm just motivating how one can obtain these non-local operators. And once we have one of these operators, I can study again the type of problem from before. It has a, an equivalent probabilistic interpretation. Now we are studying this type of, of, of equation. L of u equals to f, same as before in some domain, p1. And now u equals to g. Before we said that to have a well post problem, we needed u equals to g on the boundary of b1. Now, in order to compute the operator L of u, I need to know the value of u everywhere. So I need to impose the boundary condition not only on the boundary of b1, but also on the exterior of b1. This is called an exterior condition. So now my world post problem is by putting u equals to g outside of b1. And before going to the, to the analytic properties of the operator, of this type of operator, which is a generalization of the Laplacian, as I said, let me just very briefly mention that mathematicians have had a lot of fun playing with this type of operators in the last 20 years, especially. And that's because they have proved to be extremely useful in many different contexts, inside mathematics, but also outside. And here I'm just giving some examples of where these operators appear. And some of them we have seen, so probability and financial mathematics. Uh, we have seen examples in probability. Later, I, I'm gonna mention free boundary problems and we're gonna see a very short example in financial mathematics of the appearance of these operators. But they also appear in fluid me mechanics and kinetic theory arguably one of the best results in kinetic theory since the works of, of Villani relate to the fact that now, uh, I think the words of Ambertan Silvestre and Silvestre were able to prove that 
solutions to the Boltzmann equation under certain macroscopic conditions were smooth. And they did that realizing that in the Boltzmann equation, uh, the interaction term can be interpreted using the techniques from these integral differential operators and, and on local theory. They also appear in elasticity in the Signorini problem from the 1930s in the Pilots Navarro equation from the 1950s are problems that were originally put in a local context, but can be rephrased, reformulated from a non-local equation point of view, or in, in image processing in pattern and contour detection for images using non-local energies seems to be more stable and more accurate than using local energies in quantum, in quantum mechanics, the relativistic moment operator. And even in, in machine learning, trying to understand how the evolution of a, of the weights of a neural network of one hidden layer moves when you train the neural network includes a, an integral operator that can be well understood using the intuition built on non-local equations. So as you see, it's a very wide topic that touches many different areas inside mathematics and outside mathematics, but I want to focus on the particular properties of the operator itself. So let's start. People, when people talk about this kind of operators, people actually usually start talking about the fractional Laplacian and then move to more general things. I did it the other way around because I think it's more natural for me to motivate, but I feel compelled. I feel like I should introduce the non-local operator that people have, have in, mind, in mind when they talk about non-local operators, which is the fractional Laplacian, heavily studied from an analytic point of view in the last 20 years. The fractional Laplacian is the most canonical example of non-local operator, analogous to the Laplacian for the local case. And it basically corresponds to taking a Fourier multiplier c to the power 2s, which means basically taking, taking a Slevy measure this inverse power of y. Here I remind you what the Fourier multiplier is in terms of the operator and what the operator is in terms of the Levy measure. This operator is is denoted this, and it's called the fractional Laplacian because it's the natural way in which you would define a fractional Laplacian in terms of a Fourier perspective, right? It's an operator whose Fourier transform is C to the 2s and satisfies these properties that composition of fractional Laplacians are fractional Laplacian with a corresponding power. And when s plus t is equal to one, you actually recover the classical Laplacian. So it's what you would more or less, one of the ways you would naturally get a fractional Laplacian. In terms of the stochastic process, it corresponds to a stable and isotropic underlying Levy process. It's a Levy process that it's homogeneous and isotropic and doesn't give priority to any directions around it. And I want, when one can wonder exactly the same questions as before, is the properties of the Laplacian from before, the analytic properties I mentioned that were important, are they still preserved? Are they still true? And the answer is yes, you have to change your mind and be aware that you are in the fractional setting, but basically yes. So first property is the maximum principle holds. If an equation satisfies that the fractional Laplacian is zero in a domain, then the maximum and the minimum of the function is achieved on the boundary of the domain, but now the domain doesn't have a boundary, it's just I told you it has an exterior. So the maximum and the minimum is always achieved on the exterior of the domain. And this works for any subdomain. Okay, the maximum is always achieved in the exterior of the domain. Second property is that this boundary value problem, fractional Laplacian of u equals to f in b1 and u equals to g outside of b1, always has a unique solution. And the third property, which is the regularity property, is that the solution now has gains 2s derivatives with respect to f. Okay, so this is different from before. Before the Laplacian is an operator of order 2. The fractional Laplacian is an operator of order 2s. It's like I'm taking 2s derivatives when s is a fractional parameter. It's a fractional number of derivatives. Then I'm saying here that u gains actually 2s derivatives with respect to f. These 2s derivatives, you can understand it from a, from a holder point of view or from a Sobolev point of view. In both cases, you gain 2s derivatives. OK, so if I try to follow by symmetry what I did before, first I had um, Laplacian. Then I said, let me assume that now I have a random walk with preferences, which is basically assuming that the Laplacian is no longer isotropic, and now I have directions that I would rather choose than others. So this is the first generalization of the 
of the fractional Laplacian, which is, let me assume now that the, the kernel K is no longer this isotropic homogeneous kernel. Now the kernel K is just something that is gonna be comparable to the kernel of the fractional Laplacian, but not exactly the fractional Laplacian. This is like having preferences. This is the first typical generalization to consider for the case. And it has been studied by amazing mathematicians for 20 years now. And one can derive the same properties as for the Laplacian in this setting. However, by using this type of operator, by using this type of assumption of, of generalization of a fractional Laplacian, we are missing important examples. In this example, for example, we are missing the situation in which we have a, a vector of stochastic processes such that each component of the vector is an independent fractional Laplacian or an independent Levy process, but one dimensional fra fractional Laplacian, right? In this case, the corresponding non-local operator would be just a sum of fractional Laplacians. And you see the sum of, of Laplacians when S is one, the sum of one dimensional Laplacians is just a full dimensional Laplacian. But when S is smaller than one, the sum of fractional Laplacians is not a fractional Laplacian. It's actually an operator whose Levy measure K is gonna be on the sphere supported only on deltas in the coordinate directions. So K is not gonna be absolutely continuous. In particular, K cannot be comparable to an absolutely continuous function, but we expect for L the same properties we expect for these operators or for the fractional Laplacian. However, it's not included in this, in this analysis. So what's happening? What's happening is that we are not considering the correct white class to generalize these equations. If we want to generalize these equations in terms of regularity, the correct white class to do so is what we call the general class of operators of order 2s, which are the ones where it's not that the Levy measure is comparable to the Levy measure of the fractional Laplacian, but rather that the corresponding Fourier multiplier is comparable to the Fourier multiplier of the fractional Laplacian. And now you can tell me, well, how, how much more are you really doing by that? Well, a lot actually, because by defining this class of operators in which we are considering all operators whose Fourier multipliers are comparable to the fractional Laplacian, we are including all the previous examples. So we are including the situation where the Levy measure is comparable to the fractional Laplacian, but we're also including examples like this one, where I'm allowed to take Levy measures that are not absolutely continuous, but they still fall into this scope. And this is the class of equations, the most general class of equations of order 2s for which we expect regularity results. And this is the first result I wanted to mention. It's a bit of a technical result. It's, it's included in, in this book, Integral Differential Elliptic Equations with Xavier Rosaton. And it basically gives, it's, it's not so important what it says specifically. What's important is it gives a characterization of this general class of operators of order 2s, which is the ones whose Fourier multiplier is comparable to the fractional Laplacian. It gives a characterization in terms of the Levy measure k. So it tells you that the previous conditions in terms of the Levy measure k are these integral conditions, which are more general than this condition here from before. The good thing about this is not this result on itself, is the consequences of the result. The consequences are that Having this characterization is very easy for us then to prove that this general class of operators still satisfies the maximum principle, which are the three, these are the three properties from before. There exists always a unique solution to this boundary value problem, L of u equals to f u equals to g, when L belongs to this class. And solutions to this boundary problem where L belongs to this class gain 2s derivatives with respect to f. This I should put between quotes, but basically this is the idea. U always gains two as derivatives with respect to F. So we recover the same properties from before in a, the natural white class in which these things should be happening. And then just very briefly with this now newfound understanding, we can even consider general X dependent equations. So it's like before I told you, it could be that at each point in the space, you have a different elliptic equation. Now I can tell you, it could be that at each point in space, you have a different non-local equation which basically amounts to saying that the Levy measure K is different at each point. 
Well, thanks to the previous understanding, we can also study equations involving this X dependence. And we can also say, what's the role on the X dependence that makes it such that we can still obtain regularity theorems that the expected Schauder type regularity theorems one would expect in this setting. And we obtain the optimal conditions. This is in non-divergence form. We also do it in divergence form. This is a bit fast, but I hope the, the idea is more or less there, the idea I'm trying to convey. And this is the end of the integral differential part of, of the talk. Let me now start with free boundary problems, which is the second part of the talk. And you're going to see that it might seem a bit independent a priori, but I'm going to very much use what I've introduced until now, and it's going to be useful for me. So hopefully it's it's not too boring now, but if at some point someone was lost, this is a good point or, or was bored or whatever, is a good point to reconnect because I'm not going to use a lot of what I've done up until now. But let me start from the beginning. Pre-boundary problems from a PD point of view are basically PDs in which there is the appearance of a, an unknown interface. It's, it's a PD in which there's a, a region that we don't know a priori that has different qualitative properties. And they, they comprise applications that include biological, financial, economical, physical phenomena in which there is this extra effect of the medium uh, that gives rise to the appearance of interfaces between different regions. For example, the, the transition from ice into water, or more generally from a crystal into a liquid, or in biology, having an active population versus an inactive population. It's the same object, but it, it has an interface, the region where the population is, is active. Or in finance, having an asset, the difference between buying and, and selling an asset, you still have the same object, the same price, but according to the price, the asset is going to behave differently, whether it's worth it to sell it or to buy it. All these are examples of, of free boundary problems, the most common one being precisely Stefan's problem, which is the transition from ice into water. So we have a block of ice. We know that it's in water, and the ice is going to be smoothing out. It's becoming thinner and thinner. Um, and the question is, we don't know where the ice is. A, a priori, the ice is, is melting, but we cannot a priori control where it is. We don't know in which region the ice is. This is called a free boundary. It's because it's a, it's a region, it's, it's a set, whose boundary we cannot control. And we want to understand. From a mathematical point of view, uh, the, the, the examples I've mentioned before are all examples of something called the obstacle problem, which is the problem I want to talk about. And it's very easily represented in this picture. It's very easy to convey what the obstacle problem is by this picture. But OK, from a PDE point of view, we have some domain in Rn omega. We have some smooth obstacle phi. And we have some elliptic operator L that measures, for example, the elasticity of a membrane. What we want to do is basically we want to have a membrane with some fixed boundary values. And we want to push it from, a for, uh, from above an obstacle until the membrane touches the obstacle, right? This is called the obstacle problem. And the membrane, there's going to be a region where the membrane touches the obstacle, a region where it's above. But a priori, we cannot control which region is touching, which region is not touching. We don't know how it looks like. This, the, the, the touching region, the, is called the contact set. And the boundary of this contact set is called the free bone, because a priori, it's free. We don't know where is, where is this boundary going to appear. From a mathematical point of view, from a PD point of view, the obstacle problem is basically looking for a solution to this system of PD. We are looking for a function u that is above the obstacle in omega. u is harmonic, say, if L is the Laplacian, L of u equals to 0 whenever u is not touching the obstacle. So when u is not touching the obstacle, it's like the obstacle is not there. So the membrane is free, and it's just under the energies given by the elliptic operator L. But in general, I could touch the obstacle. And in general, at all points, L of u is greater or equal than 0. That, that is because I can always perturb my membrane in one direction, but not the other. You see, this gives rise to the appearance of a, of a contact set, which is the set where u is exactly equal to phi. But in general, u is only greater than phi. And the boundary of this contact set is called the free boundary. 
Let me mention that sometimes after a change of variables and moving things around, people call the obstacle problem to this problem here, which is this semi-linear equation, that the Laplacian of u is equal to the characteristic function of the set where u is positive. And here you can immediately see that there's a region where u is zero, where the Laplacian is zero, and the region where u is positive, where the Laplacian is one. So there's a clearly distinct behavior according to the region, but you don't know where this region is. This is the unknown of the problem. Okay, so this is what I just said, that there's the contact set, which is where u is five, and then there's the boundary of the contact set, which is the free boundary. There's a variation of formulation that I, I don't want to talk about. I want to go directly to the probabilistic interpretation, because again, same as before, I think it's fair. It's fair and, and it's easier to convey this intuition. It's also fair because the obstacle problem has been studied for, for many years from an analytic point of view or from uh, people working in analysis. But it's also true that the obstacle problem has received quite some attention from a probabilistic point of view. And probabilists have obtained very important results using different techniques. And it's not always been true that probabilists and analysts have talked to each other. So I think it's fair to introduce it from their point of view too. Uh, for probabilities, the obstacle problem is an example of the many problems they call optimal stopping problem, okay? So as before, let me give a probabilistic interpretation of what the obstacle problem is. So suppose that you're given a payoff function, phi. In this case, I'm drawing two perspectives of phi. So this is phi in R2. The darker areas are higher values of phi. This is the graph of phi in R3. So you see the darker areas. And this is given to you. This is the payoff function. We want to play a game, OK? And suppose that you have a particle that starts from a point x. And now this particle starts moving according to a levy process from x. Now, the good thing about doing the previous part of the talk is that I already introduced what levy processes are. So now you know what a levy process is. It's basically a Brownian motion with jumps. No? So the particle starts moving. And you or me is the player. Uh, and we want to, our goal is going to be that at any point, I'm always seeing where the particle is, and I always know what the underlying levy process is. And my goal is at any point, I can stop the particle. I can say, now, I stop the particle and be paid the value of the payoff function at that point. Our goal, expectedly, is to maximize the reward. Right, So it's to know at which region we will, we will want to stop. So the strategy is going to be that there's going to be some region where we will want to stop. For example, where the, the value of the payoff function is very high. At that region, we will want to stop, because otherwise, maybe the particle goes away from that region and never comes back. So it was worth it for us to stop. And there's going to be a region where the value of the payoff function is going to be very low. So it's going to be worth it for us to just wait and see if it reaches a higher value. So there's going to be the strategies going to consist of having two regions in the space, one region where we will stop, one region where we will wait. And given a strategy like that, I'm going to have some expected value of expected payoff, u, this function u, that is going to be exactly equal to the payoff function in those regions where I will stop, because I'm stopping there. So the payoff there is exactly the value of the function there. But in general, that the expected value in those regions where I will not stop, it's going to be higher than the payoff, because otherwise I would stop. If I'm not stopping, it's because I know that I'm going to be paid more. So this region is going to be higher. Well, what happens is that if you consider the optimal strategy, the one that maximizes the benefits of, of this game, is the one where u is the solution to the obstacle problem where the operator L is precisely the infinitesimal generator of the levy process, the underlying levy process. So we recovered the exact PD from before. So if you want to know what's the optimal region in which you should stop, well, it's given by the contact set of the, of the obstacle problem for that operator. And in the particular case where the underlying stochastic process is rotation invariant, unstable, or homogeneous, then necessarily, this operator L, we have seen, is a fractional Laplacian. And in that case, we call the problem the fractional obstacle problem, which is the problem I want to study. So 
Very briefly, we have the fractional obstacle problem, which has two unknowns. One is the solution U itself, and another unknown is precisely given by the contact set, which is the region where U is equal to the, to the obstacle. Okay? And we have two questions associated to that. The first question is, what's the regularity of the solution U? And the second question is, what's the regularity of the free bound? What's the regularity of the contact set? You see, even if it was true that the regularity of the solution U is very smooth and the obstacle was very smooth, the contact set between two very smooth functions doesn't need to be very nice. It could still be a very, very ugly thing. So this is a separate question, trying to understand the regularity of the free boundary from the regularity of the solution. Known results. So here I'm mentioning this known result. It's a consequence of many other known results from before. It's a result by Caffarelli, Sass, and Silvestre. From 2007, this is. And basically says, answers more or less both questions. The first question, it says that solution to the obstacle problem are C1s. C1s means that solutions are C1, and first derivatives are Cs, where S is a number between 0 and 1 which means that they are holder continuous with power s. It's just an explicit modulus of continuity for first derivatives. And this is optimal. Solutions are not better than that. And then the free boundary, which is the, the boundary of the contact set, has two types of points. Has regular points and non-regular points. So this is a bit tautological at this point, but basically there's those points that are called regular points in which the free boundary is smooth. It's actually analytic, and they are an open subset of the free boundary. They actually characterize what regular points look like. Regular points are the points where the optimal regularity C1s is achieved. And then you have these other non-regular points, which is the rest of points. It, they can be very ugly. And since this result, there have been many, many other results by many people trying to understand in most cases, trying to understand what these other non-regular points look like. Here I'm giving just some examples uh, that try to understand in the general setting what the set of degenerate or non-regular points can be. And we can see that it's actually a very wide and diverse set. Let me give an example. So, sorry, this is a non-equivalent characterization. Let me give an example by a picture. So this is a possible picture of the contact set in the, in the fractional obstacle problem. The gray area, this is in R2. The gray area is a possible contact set. This is possible in the sense that we don't know how to prove that this cannot happen. So a priori, it is possible. And you can see clearly where the set of regular points would be like. So these are the very nice subset of the free boundary. This could be, for example, a subset of regular points. But you can also clearly see what the set of non-regular points looks like. So this could be a non-regular point. This could be a non-regular point. This could be a non-regular point. And in this picture, maybe the elephant in the room is that all these boundary could be non-regular points. You see, this is the Mandelbrot set. This is a, an a priori acceptable free boundary. We know how to construct this one. And in this case, you see that the free boundary, if this free boundary has dimension one, in this case, the free boundary has dimension higher than one. So we are in a situation in which we have a characterization of regular points, but we have a bunch of other points for which we can say nothing. They are extremely ugly, and a priori they could even be larger than regular points. So it's not a very satisfying characterization, a priori. And this is where the last results I wanted to mention come into play, which is, these are called generic regularity type results which is basically saying that, okay, it's true that a priori points that are not regular can be as large as regular points, but it's not common. What we say is that for almost every solution, this doesn't happen. And this for almost every solution is what we call a generic regularity type result. And we say for almost every solution from a measure theoretical point of view, this is from the theory of prevalence, which is saying that if you have a family of solutions indexed by, say, the boundary datum for some height uh, lambda, for all, if a property holds for almost every lambda in the height, then it holds for almost every solution. If you have a solution, you, you increase by lambda, and it holds for, every lamb, for almost every lambda, it holds for almost every solution. 
This is a major theoretic way of called of generic regularity type results in infinite dimensional spaces, which is the space of boundary data. And the first result I wanted to mention is this result that says exactly what I just said, is that a priori, the set of non-regular points can be as large or larger than the set of regular points, but this isn't common. That is, for almost every solution, the set of non-regular points has at most one dimension less than the set of regular points. The, 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 thing to, the key thing here is that it calls for almost every solution. It's true that we can construct solutions in which this is not true, but this is rare. For almost every solution, the free boundary is a set of n minus one dimensions. So for almost every solution, the, the, the set of points in the boundary that are not smooth have n minus two dimensions at most. And the second result, joined with Clara Torres La Torre, it says that in the case s equal one, we can actually upgrade this result I'd say, and say that in dimension three, for almost every solution, the full free boundary is smooth. So there's no degenerate points. Again, in this case, it's true that there's there could be points that are, or there could be solutions that have non-smooth points, but these solutions are rare. In general, for almost every solution with probability one, if we select a solution with probability one, it's gonna have a smooth free boundary in dimension three. And there's two takeaways from this type of results. The first takeaway is that um, if it ever happens to you, which is something very common, that you are given a solution to the obstacle problem, to the fractional obstacle problem, and the solution has non-regular points, um, so to say, be suspicious in a way that the person who is giving the solution is not being fair to you because that happens with probability zero. The second takeaway is that, okay, it, this could always happen, if, even if it's just by continuity, it could always happen. You get one of these solutions, no? Even if they have probability zero. The good thing is that if you are given a solution that has a bad point and you want to get rid of the bad point, just perturb the solution. Choose an epsilon, any epsilon you want, and perturb the solution by epsilon, and you're going to remove the bad points. You can, making arbitrary small perturbations, you can remove all bad points and recover a solution that has a smooth free boundary. And that's that's all. Thank you very much. Bueno, muchas, pues muchas gracias, Xavier, por la, por la fantástica charla. Eh, ¿Hay alguna pregunta, cuestión, comentario? ¿Os podéis eh, activar el sonido vosotros? Si no hay nada. Eh, en el último, mientras... En el tema, eh, el, el último que has, que has contado, bueno, el penúltimo, no sé, eh, no sé si la, la, el free boundary está infinito para el fractional obstacle problems, entiendo que ese teorema no de, bueno, ya se ve, no depende de ese, quiero decir, la dependencia de ese no está, eh, no está en la dimensión n-2 ni, ni Puedes, bueno, ni puede estar, no sé, no sé cuál es muy bien cuál es la pregunta, pero no, es, no es una muy buena pregunta. Cero y uno. Esa es parte um, de una pregunta, y luego el caso es igual a uno, como eh, que debería ser más. El caso es igual a uno, ¿qué aspecto tiene? Vale. Son dos preguntas en uno. Vale. Primera pregunta. Uh, eh, bueno, sí, que la, la dependencia es. Um, so, la respuesta es no, no depende de eso. Tal y como está escrito, no depende de eso. Pero. Es verdad que en realidad sí depende de ese. Para S correcta, puedes mejorar esto. O sea, para toda S en, ter en tercero y uno, N menos dos funciona. Pero no me acuerdo cuándo era. ¿eh? Como si fuera N menos dos menos S o algo así. Sí, algo que En realidad, que... Pues, dependiendo de la S, puedes mejorar. Ok. Pero para todo S funciona esto, entonces es más fácil de ponerlo así, es más limpio también. Vale. El caso S igual a uno es el, para el problema del obstáculo clásico. Um, no me he querido meter en este caso por dos motivos uno es que el tipo de punto regular e irregular de generate y este tipo de puntos es completamente diferente en el caso fraccionario y en el caso local y el segundo en el, que en el caso local hay los trabajos de Alessio Figal y Xavier Rosotón y Joaquín Serra que hacen esto mucho más técnico, mucho más profundo y obteniendo resultados mucho mejores 
también porque hay menos casos a considerar, pero al, el resultado final es mucho mejor y mucho más, y se entiende mucho mejor el problema. En este caso, nos gustaría llegar a, ese, a esos tipos de resultados. No podemos todavía. En el caso local, por ejemplo, este dibujo de aquí, esto puede pasar, pero esto, esto y esto no puede pasar. Entonces hay como menos clases de puntos no regulares. Es, eh, el estudio es un poco diferente. Al menos para este teorema, el estudio entre el local y el no local se hace bastante diferente. Para este, tenemos que utilizar ideas del local para poder llegar a un resultado que es peor que el local. Entonces. Ok, gracias. ¿Alguna otra pregunta, comentario? Bueno, pues si nadie, si nadie se anima, eh, agradecemos de nuevo a, a Xavier eh, tu charla. Dejamos, dejamos la grabación. Muchas gracias, Xavier, por, por la charla. Gracias a vosotros.